topic of debugging is a is very dear to my heart. It's an a very and it's a very important uh, topic, really, for how how people do HPC. Um, I'm actually going to talk about two things. One, one is debugging, and, and one is profiling. So within this 45-minute uh, slot, you actually get two tools for the price of one here. Um, so um, this is all about a linear forge, which is the combination of DDT, the debugger, and map the profiler together. Um, so I, I hope not to teach you just about how to use our tools. Um, of course, there's limits on time that we have. I need to show you some of these things so that you know how to apply them. But actually, debugging and profiling are all about techniques that you can take home, really. And they do transfer across the tools. Uh, so we're going to use a linear forge. We're going to be debugging with DDT, profiling with map, and, um, and, uh, and should point out before I go any further that map is not on the Blue Gene Q systems here, but it is available on Cooley and a number of the other systems that you've probably got remote access to as well. Um, so for debugging, we, we, we're on uh, DDT is on the uh, all of the Blue Gene systems here, uh, but uh, debugging and profiling will be used Cooley for that. Um, so you can find Alinea's tools on roughly 70% of the of the, height of the top machines out there. Um, so there's a good chance you've probably got access to, the, to, to them already in one of the machines that you use. Um, so the motivation uh, for me is that, uh, and hopefully for, for a lot of you here, is that we've got to appreciate that HPC systems are, are finite and they're there to, p to perform a task. And that task is to create science, to give good results. And they've got a limited lifetime. Uh, three to five years being the typical lifetime for a, for a system. They're a precious resource. They, are, they can be phenomenally expensive machines, but what you get out of them is priceless. Um, but you are sharing that precious resource, so it's really important that you use that limited allocation well. Um, so, but the systems are important, of course, but it's actually you, your time, that's, that's even more, more, more precious to yourselves because you've got perhaps a PhD to submit, uh, certainly projects to complete, papers to write, careers to develop, and so forth. So the more time that you spend doing things in a way that may not be optimal, then the less time you've got to do the good things through which you'll make your mark on those HPC systems and the community. And so doing good things means, with HPC means creating better software and creating that faster. Um, so you need to have productive, be productive using productive tools that will help you do that and get your tools, your software, so that it runs and runs well and scales up on the sizes of the machines you've been uh, talking about all over the last few days. So the way we do that is through using tools and tools that have been designed for the challenge. So if you use the right software tools, you will um, improve what you're doing, whether that's removing bottlenecks from a HPC code, uh, just tuning them generally, uh, resolving defects, crashes, stalls, things that you would typically use a debugger for, and checking the output. And so a tool helps you to understand which parts of the code would benefit from, say, being rewritten, or which parts need changing to, to fix something that's just not working. But actually, in practice, um, if you've... Well, anyone who's written code has probably used the printf debugger at some point in their life. And this is where your code runs, it crashes, you have an idea as to why it's crashing, so you insert a print statement, you compile it up, you run, and you try again. And you go around this circle quite a few times. Now, I'm not here to talk about printf too much, but uh, it is something we all know. I mean, the very first program most people would have written was probably along the lines of a print hello world. So it's a technique we're almost born with. Um, but, you know, we're using some very important machines here. We need to do things a little differently. And actually, the field of optimization in practice is, uh, is similar to debugging in that it has a, a, a sort of free alternative, which is the uh, using your stopwatch or editing your uh, code and inserting some print statements with timing things in there. You insert the timers, you run the code, you analyze the result, you change the code. And you go round and round and get round because perhaps it wasn't as effective as you expected. Perhaps you instrumented the wrong part of your code, that kind of thing. So 
The next part of motivation is, of course, all about the size of the machines. Because the techniques you've seen to do debugging and printf, uh, with printf or profiling with, with a stopwatch, perhaps they're helpful for when you've got a small number of cores. But actually, it's all about the software, and we're all about big machines in this uh, extreme scale um, workshop. And the number of machines out there with tens of thousands of cores is just marching upwards. I haven't actually updated this since last um, November, but I imagine with the new list that only came out three or four weeks ago, we're now over 500 machines with more than 10,000 cores in, and we're probably maybe up to 50, certainly over 40, with machines over 100,000 cores. So there's a very good chance that even outside of the Argon system, systems, you will have access to other huge machines. But what was written um, by one of the Council of Competitors, con the Council on Competitiveness over here, was that without software, highly capable highly parallel software, large supercomputers are less useful. They're perhaps being polite there, because to be honest, without the software, you know, the systems are actually useless. Um, some while ago, it's a number of years ago, only 1% of HPC codes could exploit 10,000 cores. This is, uh, at this point here, that was said uh, in 2011. Yet at that time, you know, there was 250 machines of that size. So there's a lot of codes out there just not able to take advantage of machines then. And I don't think the picture has improved much. You know, we're all working on that, of course. So if you look at what you're you as developers are going to achieve, as computational scientists, what you're going to achieve through, through your software development, and how are you going to do that in practice? Well, there'll be coding, there'll be profiling, there'll be optimization, running the code in production, perhaps, and then debugging it when you find the problems. And you'll, it's, it's a workflow that, that continues throughout the life cycle of a large application. You probably arrive to a, a code that already exists and are then asked to modify it in some way. You might change it. It might run a bit slower, so you start profiling, optimizing it, running it again, new, new method. New method brings in a bug because it's a huge code you're working on, et cetera. So it's a loop there. So you, as computational scientists and developers, do all of this stuff, and science too. So how does Alinea try and help you here? Well, we have Alinea Forge. And Alinea Forge actually includes debugging and profiling. So it really fills that circle for you. Uh, you can, and the interesting point is how often you'll find that profiling leads to debugging and debugging leads to profiling. Uh, for example, you'll find a performance bottleneck with a profiler, but you won't necessarily understand why your workload is imbalanced. Um, you, know, you might not understand why your memory usage is increasing over time. And both of those would be a good excuse to switch to, being, to using a debugger because then you can actually look at the variables inside your code to actually examine every single process and every single variable and see what led to something happening. You know, why do I have slower performance on process zero? It's because it's got more boundary elements in my partition, for example, or something like that. So with Alinea Forge, you can actually use the profiler and then switch to the debugger and then go through and observe that code step by step. Um, I should also... Um, mention at this point, uh, we have a remote client that lets you access these tools on HPC systems throughout the world, uh, wherever you have access to one. Because we know in HPC, it's a, it's a different world than, than most programming. It's actually something where you do actually uh, work on systems that are often some distance from where you are. So our remote client is a, is a native client. Uh, it's available for Linux, OS X, and Windows. And this is totally free, you download it, and it connects to wherever you need, uh, no matter how complicated the SSH and the RSA crypto cards or whatever it is you're using to do that are. So you, you're basically SSHing in using Alinea's GUI, uh, which is running on your system, and it picks up the tools that have been installed remotely, and it's doing this all through um, something that uses very little, a very small amount of bandwidth. It's, it's not it's not drawing everything over at Argon and then fetching it to home for you. It's actually drawing it all on your local desktop, just fetching the amount of data that it needs to do debugging or profiling. So that might be, you know, step all my processes, a single command, and back comes where are all the processes now. So it's really fast. It's, it's, it's native speed. It's almost like debugging on your, on your own desktop of a code running on your desktop. Um, so I'll start by talking about uh, performance profiling.
I think we all know that uh, code optimization can be time consuming. Um, there are many reasons why that happens. Uh, I do like this, uh, this particular picture from XKCD. Uh, we, we don't want to spend too long analyzing whether strategy A or strategy B is the right one. OK, so perhaps if we are able to use tools that will help us or methods that will help us, more importantly as well, then we can improve performance without it being an inefficient thing to do. So firstly, I always think it's important to use a realistic test case. If you cripple, uh, if, yes, creating a small sort of crippled computational kernel is important to understand some of the aspects of your performance. But if you're trying to look at the whole picture of a HPC code, running on a system where you've got I.O. to worry about, MPI to worry about, and so forth, then you can't beat actually having something that looks like a real data set in terms of its size, its shape. Um, and you should keep that and keep that test case as a reference for future use. If you fix something today, if you're working on a code that you're sharing with other people, every time you're optimizing something, you've got other people in the group who are probably de-optimizing it. So Make sure that you're able to say, yeah, today it ran at that speed on this machine using this test case, and then six weeks down the line, you can reproduce that. So to profile your code, um, with a linear map, you have to, it helps rather, to add the minus G flag to your compilation. Uh, that way we can get line number information. It won't change the speed of your code, but it will let you see what lines your performance issues are happening on. And then all you need to do is map minus profile MPI run, or your existing MPI run line, that is, and it will go off and it'll do it and it'll create a profile. Or you can do it all in the GUI, as I'll show later. Um, once you've got the, the GUI displaying the performance, the important things to do are out of cost. Look for the significant. Don't spend your time trying to optimize something that's less than 2 or 3% of the performance, because you're never going to get more than 2 or 3% improvement. OK, that's pretty obvious to say, but actually the most important thing to do is focus. And if someone says, we need to rewrite this thing, it's not scalable, prove it. Go and run it and say, actually, it's 1% it's of my performance. I, I'll, I'll put my time elsewhere. Um, we were just recently working with a CFD company who had a problem scaling one of their codes. And uh, they, was, they were about to go off on one angle. And they, went, and they realized they should profile it first. And they managed to speed up something. For, on 128 cores, it was taking four hours. And it ended up taking two seconds. Because, that's a good day's work, right? Um, so once you're looking at the significant, you might find things that you didn't expect to see. And that's, that's I find one of the things about performance profiling is you often go for the hard problems. But go for the ones that are the important ones. OK? Um, once you've got that profile up and you've focused on the area that is significant, try and understand what that problem is. Is it compute? Is it I.O.? MPI? Thread synchronization? Display the things inside map or whichever profiling tool you're using that would show that problem best. Okay? And then you need to apply your brain to that to solve the problem. Because every, uh, every one of those problems has a different method of, of changing it, of, of improving it. Um, so MPI, could you balance the work better? Could you change the pattern of communication? For compute, is it the memory that's the issue? Is, are you not actually getting many computations out there at all? Very few floating points, it's all memory. Could you change the layout of your things from structures of arrays to arrays of structures, or the other way around, or whatever works for you? Um, or even, are you doing computation that really you don't need to do, or you should cache and do only once in the lifetime of an application? And also, try and think of the future. Try some larger process or thread counts so you can see scalability problems before you start wasting big machine time. Um, the behavior of a code on four procs is going to be a lot different than on a 1,000 procs, you know, or even 100 procs. You will see, you will see the differences as asymptotic effects come in. So do try larger ones. And also, try and keep those uh, profiles that you make. So if you create a map profile, it's a small file that's the run of the application. You can always load it up in the map, map GUI in the future. Keep that. Put it in your version control system alongside, the, you know, to, you know in, the, in the release that it's in. So you say, right, I know that this build took this long to run on this machine at this point in time. It's also good for, track, for, for tracking down when someone's broken the machine. OK. So what does map look like? Uh, what does it do? Well, in a nutshell, some of the things about it are that um, 
it creates very small data files. So if you were running on, say, the full size of something like a Titan or a Edison, something like that, it would still give you small data files out. And that's because it's using sampling, as we've heard today from other talks. Sampling is where you stop the processor uh, a certain number of times per second, you look at what it's doing, and you use that to interpret everything you need about performance. It's not about measuring or recording every single MPI communication or every single event. It's about sampling and seeing where you are. It's kind of more statistical, which is what we need for large scale. So small data files, um, you'd certainly 20 to 50 megabytes is the largest data file I've ever seen out of, out of MAP, and that has been on very high core counts. Um, we wouldn't expect it to slow down your application at much at all. In fact, less than 5% is typically what we would see. Often it's far less than 5%, so you can profile it, and what you're seeing is actually realistic. It's like, you know, th if there's a time issue in there, it, it is actually the same kind of time issue it would be if you were running without the profiler. It's not breaking what it's trying to record for you, so it's actually showing you useful information. Uh, you don't have to change your code at all. I mentioned adding a minus G. That's the only thing you would do during the compilation. Okay? Nothing else. You can run it without the minus G, so just on your existing binary, but you really might want to see the source code, as you can see here, with sort of timing instrumentation information next to it. And, of course, you don't have to recompile, as I mentioned. So some of the things that make map different from profilers you may have worked with before. Um, our sampling frequency is adaptive. So if you run for a day, you get the same number of samples out as if you ran for a week. So that's why those files never get any bigger. Okay? Over time, the frequency decreases, keeps that data short, but lets you run and profile realistic jobs at full size if you so wish. Scalable, we're using a, a very scalable infrastructure underneath. We have a tree architecture that goes off on every compute node and at the end of a job merges the data up. Um, and so that lets us handle very high core counts very fast. So we use the same structure for the debugger and for the profiler. Um, we're analyzing the instructions you've been executing as well. So when it samples, it looks at the instruction you've just done, and it says, what kind of instruction is this? Is it a memory read? Is it a vectorized instruction? Is it a floating point instruction? So it gives you a good idea as to you know, how well you're doing on things like vectorization. Um, we can also profile your OpenMP. As I mentioned earlier, OpenMP can be quite a difficult thing to profile. Uh, the, and there is work going on to try and standardize to make it much easier for profilers in the future. But until that happens, we've, had, we've worked with all of, the, uh, all of the compiler vendors to create instrumentation that works for theirs as well. Uh, and what we do is we're sampling the core that is executing the OpenMP thread rather than the thread. Because in HPC, it's really important to profile um, threads rather than, uh, sorry, cores rather than threads. Because if you were running something that wasn't HPC and you had a thread and it was asleep, that's fine. In HPC, when a thread is sleeping, waiting for something else to happen, that's wasted CPU time because you have as many cores as you have threads with OpenMP. So uh, we're able to identify when something's lost through OpenMP synchronization through that. And it's also part of, uh, of a full suite that lets you edit, build, compile, sorry, edit, compile, commit, uh, that kind of thing. So it's all part of a, a Linear's Forge suite. Um, and it's kind of nice, slick GUI for zooming in into areas of your code that and, you know, shows all the information straight alongside your source code. So, but above all, I think uh, it's important to say it's, aimed, it's not a generic, uh, so it, it doesn't uh, focus on a single problem. It doesn't say, you have an MPI problem, therefore use map. This is a use map, and then you'll understand which problem you have. You know, you don't. You, you should profile something first so you can understand what the problems are. And map is able to do pretty much all the kinds of problems you're likely to come across. So you will, from this, be able to discover your MPI problems, your thread problems, your I/O problems, your compute problems, and so forth. Um, and if it is a problem, it'll show up next to your code. So this is an example uh, which you see here for screenshots of, of a session of 512 processes. Um, this was a, a code that had been shown to scale on one of the blue jeans here, actually, a few years ago at 32,000 cores. But it went onto a Cray, and performance was terrible at 512 processes on a particular test case. And they didn't understand why. 
And it's kind of hard to uh, narrow these things down without putting a profiler on them. You know, your code is suddenly slow. What have you got to go on other than it's slow? Um, so we fired up map, and um, it showed us a interesting set of patterns. Across the top here, we have um, a time zero through to the end of a job. And we have uh, little graphs being shown here a long time um, of the minimum of, of a certain metric, the maximum, and then the, uh, the median, along with a, a plot of shading that represents the standard deviation. So this top line here, for example, is showing the memory usage over time. There's obviously different usage on one process versus the other. It's not a straight, single bar wide line. Here's some MPI call durations. But this was the interesting thing, the CPU floating point. Um, a lot of variance at, at each point was, this is showing at each point we sample what, what was going on at that point. So the average was quite low, it was about 11%. But the interesting points were these here. You can see this, this sawtooth effect where nothing was happening. There's one here. So what we did was we were able to just, uh, well, actually, we looked down at the source code to see what was going on. Um, actually, we zoomed in first. Well, that helped. So we just, on the timeline, you can actually select a region. Once we'd zoomed in, we were able to see that it actually all went down to this line here. So this is a um, top-down look of uh, the amount of time is, that is spent in the region you've got selected. So in this case, 34% of our time was going into MPI uh, at this line, although actually it was MPI IO. And so it turned out that actually it was just doing um, uh, little checkpoints in the code that it really didn't need to be writing out to the file. So we turned that off, and of course, suddenly scaling was where it was expected to be. So it was a very simple problem. It didn't even need the code to change, um, but it was something that is very hard to diagnose. Um, after they'd done that, they were still uh, a little bit unhappy with the performance. Um, so Map can look inside those instructions, as I mentioned, and show you what's been happening over time or over the selected region you're interested in, uh, and categorizes the instructions. So the memory access pattern was, was reasonable. It was like 30 to 40 percent on average. Uh, floating point was 50-something percent of time. Um, but what they were seeing was a flatlining here of vectorized instructions. You know, vectorized instructions are a good 4x of your performance, if not 8x, uh, depending on how you double or single precision. Um, so if you're not getting vectorization, then you're not getting decent floating point performance. But yet they'd, they'd done lots of work for vectorization. They'd, they'd even hard coded in some SSE instructions and stuff like that. And so what on earth was going on? And at that point, it was, of course, time to switch to a debugger and see why this particular code path wasn't happening. So that's the kind of um, thing that you find with, with profiling. It can lead to, the, uh, to another situation. Um, so before we, we, we talk about debuggers, it's uh, good to know what kind of things bugs are before we, be, de, uh, you know, before we try, try to solve them. It's good to know what they are. Um, so a bore bug, steady, dependable bug. You probably recognize these. These are the kinds of crashes that happen every time, or the result is wrong every time. Steady, dependable. I love them. They're great bugs because you can fix them really quickly. OK? Heisen bugs. They vanish when you try to debug them. Yep, they happen. They do happen. Those kinds of random bugs. And they can come in through things like um, memory problems. You're reading or writing beyond the end of an array. Then that's not going to crash every single time it runs because it all depends on whether that one element beyond the end of the array happen to be on a page boundary that causes the operating system to say, you've touched a piece of memory that doesn't belong to you. OK? Things like that happen randomly. I mean, the good thing about HPC and running on hundreds of thousands of cores is, of course, that the more cores you have, the more probability there is of these things happening. <laughs> but yeah, they're still random fundamentally. Um, a Mandel bug, sometimes you do get complex, obscure bugs that are just so, so crazy. They do look to be chaotic, but you know, you can fix them, because at least fundamentally, there is a good reason they happened. And I've actually seen these happen, the Schroding bugs, where you read the source code, figure out that it could never have worked, and then it just stops working. Uh, but the art of, of debugging is all about transforming a broken program to a working one. There is a whole wealth of theory and, and methods and ideas as to why and how you might want to debug. Um, and I couldn't possibly go into all of it today. Um, but there is a number of steps you can take to do a better job of, of doing it. And one of the more important 
or some of the more important things to pick out from that uh, acronym of traffic is that it's really important to track your bugs because during fixing one bug, you'll probably find another bug. So make sure you've got a good bug tracking system with your project. So there are a number of three ones out of there out there for any software project. So just you choose them. Choose one, use it, but just log what you've got. Make a test case so you can always prove you've fixed it. Um, you, it's very easy to go crazy by just um, thinking you fixed something or you know, uh, you, you'll, you kind of get blind to being seeing a solution. So it's really important to, to automate a test case so you can prove you fixed it. And uh, you know, it really helps. You can also use that for future so it won't come back. Then you have to try and understand where it's come from uh, and what kind of techniques you're going to use to try and fix that, et cetera. So some of the other ideas, of course, is isolating where a problem could have come from. Has anyone ever used bisection to find a bug? Great, great. Preaching to the converter, that's brilliant. Uh, those who don't know it, if you're using a version control system, perhaps like a Git or a Mercurial, you can actually say you had a program that worked last week and it doesn't work now. Then there's a finite set of changes happened in the middle. And if you write a test case, you can feed that to uh, the bisect command in, in Mercurial and in Git, and it will build up. Uh, it'll basically build the version of code that worked, and, and then it'll look at that, the one that doesn't work, and then it'll build one up in the middle between them, and just keep building and testing until it's found the exact change that broke your code. Okay, So that's great. You can actually go off to lunch, come back, and it'll say, Bob committed a code fix here, uh, then he broke it. <laughs> so not only did you not have to spend your lunchtime fix, uh, finding the bug, you've also found who to blame. Uh, in terms of reading, uh, Why Programs Fail is a good book by Andreas Zeller. Um, and another one there is Robert Persig's Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which is about debugging. <laughs> so back to print statements. Um, as I said, the first print uh, debugger is, is, that we all know is, of course, print statements. Um, you put a message at various points in your code to say, I'm here, and here are the values I'm seeing. But it's just too long and slow. It's a bisection thing. Even with a bore bug, you can't print out after you've crashed. So you're always putting it here, here. Have I got to this point yet? You're either too far or, or not far enough to actually narrow it down to the exact line. And it can also cause Heisen bugs to go away while you're watching them, because you've changed the code. By inserting a print statement, you've changed the way the memory is laid out. So it's a long, slow process that doesn't really get you where you need to be at modest scale. And when you're on the machines, such as the ones you're using this week, really, it's not where to go. Uh, so we've been profiling. We've used our profiler. All we need to do now <coughs> is to uh, switch to using the debugger by pressing the DDT button instead of the map button. And we're ready to go. In fact, we get the same settings that we had for when we were using profiling. And we can just press Run, and we're going. So what does a debugger do? Uh, it helps you to identify who's got the rogue behavior. So what we're doing is we're merging the stacks from the processes and the threads. Um, you can see it under the hood here, showing you exactly where all of your thousands of processes are at this point in time. Okay? And if you see one process on one line and a thousand on another line, Perhaps there's something wrong with that uh, one that's only on one line. Um, and some bugs, like bore bugs, when you have a crash, the leap uh, uh, it's great, because the debugger will just stop your code at the exact line a segmentation fault happens. And leaps to the source, you can see it. You can probably, from the source code in a bore bug, more often than not, figure out the, in the fix within, you know, within minutes. And you'll see messages to what kind of bug and crash it was. But sometimes you need to know a little bit more about things. And so DDT does things like uh, evaluates variables across all of your processes and plots you a little graph uh, of that value across all of those procs. So instead of having to click from one process to another to try and debug thousands, it's doing it for you. It's getting the values. So here is, uh, for example, is a problem that was uh, a transient bug in, in an MPI distribution at one point where the MPI rank was coming back incorrectly. And so instead of, and this, this was something we would never have thought to have checked could have gone wrong. But when we saw the graph of the MPI rank, which should have gone from naught up to MPI uh, number of procs in the job in a diagonal line being a squiggly line, that was, that was you know, the red flag. We knew exactly what had gone wrong. Okay? So patterns that you're not expecting are very easy to see when they're visual. So blue means it's, um, 
the value is different, uh, where the value has just changed. Green means it's different on other processes, etc. So we're doing a lot of things to make it easy for you to see why something's wrong. Just give you another example of what it's like to debug when you've got a lot of core counts. Um, there's one particular code uh, this we were looking at last year where uh, they were trying to do aneurysm modeling. And they needed to prove that their code could actually do petascale modeling of, of the blood flow within a brain. Um, unfortunately, as they uh, got access to a big machine, they suddenly found that as they kept doubling the core count, they get, got to 50,000 cores, and it just crashed. Um, and it had been working perfectly up until that point. We were actually able to reproduce the bug at a slightly smaller count when we got access to the machine. And yeah, we've well, run it at the problem size is the way we, we, uh, we tried to fix it. So they had a choice at that point. They knew that something was wrong, and they also thought, well, we spent three months with print statements or a year rewriting a partitioning library, perhaps, if that's where the problem is, et cetera. But whatever it was they would have had to have done, they wouldn't have been doing the science that they wanted. They wouldn't have been the first to publish a result on something. So doing it quickly actually is a very good use of your time. Um, so this is what they saw when they were running at 49,000 core. Uh, actually, this is a 20-something thousand core run of it. Um, source code just looks like, a, like DDT does. Um, there are a number of processes being shown up here and what they're doing. So in this one, you can't quite read it, but it says 17,220 are paused and 7,354 are playing. You can see the values of the variables across those procs even at that scale. And they saw it was crashing inside Parmetis, which is one of the partitioning libraries. Um, that was, so this is all 17,220 that have crashed. The others are just playing. They're happy. They've not crashed. It's a bit strange. Um, but you're seeing they're all in exactly the same location, exactly the same call stack. Well, that's great. That makes it a little, possibly easier to fix. We could see it was on this line. The debugger took us straight to that line. And it was a segmentation fault. So my picks. Is, I, is, is possibly wrong, I is possibly wrong, all picks could be wrong, or this calculation could be wrong. OK? That's the only things that could cause a segmentation fault on that line. And of course, what did you see? Value optimized out. They were doing minus G and minus O3 as the compilation options. If you can, and you, if you want to debug properly, just try and put as little optimization in as possible, because sometimes the compiler will strip out the information that the debugger needs to be able to help you. So what we did was we ran it through again with a proper compilation. And now we got some decent numbers out. NT samples was 1.8 1, 1, 1. million. Number of procs in this point was that. OK. And then what was I times NT samples? Oh, it's negative. All right. Ah, <laughs> yeah. So integer overflow. And what was it? We could see that, uh, that um, the debugger was telling us that it was a 32-bit integer. And when you've got 20-some thousand processors, you like using 13 or 14 of the 32 bits just for IDs, and then you sample data itself. No wonder you were overflowing. Um, it turned out there was actually a compilation option to fix that in Parmetis, but it was very well hidden, very, not very documented. And even then, you know, that made all your indices 64-bit, which is a bit of space you didn't necessarily need to use up. And it would have been easier just to have put some casting inside the calculation there. OK, and then uh, that's that at the end of the picture. Um, there are many other ways to, um, to tackle bugs than simple ones like that, where it actually just crashed at a location. And some, as we mentioned, are harder to diagnose. Um, Ball bugs are great. Those that are happening like Heisenbugs 1% of the time are just many times ha harder to fix than those that occur all the time. Um, but the, as I've said, they're also often caused by incorrect memory usage. You can use memory debugging in DDT. This does things like check whether you, you're freeing the same memory allocation twice, using a pointer after you've, after you've freed it, a dangling pointer. Um, you can check whether you're reading or writing beyond the end of an array through what's called gu the guard pages. So if you one element over the end, the operating system stops the debugger, which stops your process straight away. And then you can also find memory leaks, which are another um, thing that would cause a, an application to just fall over at a certain point in time. And other ways of solving problems are actually working with your colleagues. Um, try explaining what it is that you've done. And that actually can help you explain. The very act of explaining your thinking can sometimes help you understand your code. And if you don't have a colleague to hand, there's the rubber duck debugging 
There's actually a website about this technique. If you get a little rubber duck and talk to them how to about what your code is trying to do, and it actually helps you to think about your code. So my favorite features for DDT when I'm working at large scale, seeing the stacks of all the processes at the same time. So 1,000 processes are just as easy to see as 150,000, as we're showing 150,000 here. The automatic, da automatic data comparison, that's the same. It's very easy to see a pattern in it. Looking at arrays across all processes and searching for NANs, we do that all uh, on, every, on every node out there, so we can do it really quickly. You can still step, play, and do breakpoints, which is where I'll show you in a moment um, how you can control things with a debugger. And you can even run code overnight for our offline mode, where you're trying to run a large job, a large core count. You're not going to get instant access to it. But if you put it in the queue, let it run overnight, and you get HTML report back that tells you what happened, then your problem's fixed. And they're all parallel, so that's all very, very quick. Um, we've got users out there already using it well over 100,000 cores. Um, I personally have not seen Map used over 50,000 cores yet, but when we did do 50,000, it was very successful for the user indeed. Um, and some people just use it for a single proc as well. Um, you'll find uh, DDT available on Blue Waters, Titan, Mira, Edison, and so forth. And, and you know, our tools are on much, hundreds of much smaller systems out there in academic research and, and so forth. But fundamentally, we're all about helping you to do the, what you're trying to get to, really, which is the whole range of the ambition. Um, you can do things that I haven't covered, such as replace your printf with something that logs the values as you cross each process and plots a little squiggly line, the, the graph of the variable over each process at the point it passes it. Stop on when a variable changes. So sometimes you might have a variable that changes, changes value, and you weren't expecting that. Um, the debuggers can actually trap for that. As soon as a variable is changed, it'll, the operating system tells the debugger to stop, and the, the debugger stops and shows you the exact line something has changed. If you compare that with trying to figure out when someone was overwriting your memory location, it's, it's a lot easier. We've inbuilt static analysis so you can understand why sometimes you're not using a variable that you thought you were using, uh, for example. And as I mentioned before, read-write errors and stale out the memory allocations. If you're profiling, I couldn't knock it down to just five features, so I ended up with six very quickly. And it won't go backwards. There we go. Um, finding the peak memory use is something people are, although the profiler was written with the intention of speed in mind, a lot of people actually like to see that we're able to see o the phases over the execution of their program that are actually using more memory, and they can zoom in on the area that do that. Fixing MPI imbalances. We're showing uh, MPI communication here. Looking at I.O., um, doing OpenMP profiling. This is a, a code that was green, meaning uh, actually do compute here. When we got a complete gray area, it meant no uh, compute was happening. And there's a number of times OpenMP doesn't give you the performance you're expecting when it's involving synchronization and things. And we were able to make one uh, benchmark code run almost 10% faster because it had a critical region. And we just commented out the OpenMP block, and it just ran and worked properly. Um, and there are many things you can do to look at the memory access and its patterns and also improve your vectorization. So with those kinds of little pictures uh, in your mind, I'd like to just do a quick demo of, of, the, of the tools so you can actually see what they will look like. So this is uh, the DDT user interface, which make it a bit bigger. Um, you choose between the debugger and the profiler. You can run and debug. I'm actually connected to Cooley here. Um, and this particular code, C start MPI, which is a very simple one, but I know it's going to crash on me. So uh, I'm just going to click Submit. I'm asked for 16 processes spread over two nodes. Submit, and then we'll see how quick it is today. I only asked for two nodes, so it shouldn't be too bad. Ah, there we go, starting. Running, OK. There we go. Getting our connections in, and then we're ready to go. So the debugger has started up your processes, and they're all now under its control. 
When you're running at small scale, you get the processors as little red boxes here. Uh, red meaning paused, and if they were green, they would actually be still executing. So you can see that we have a blue line here, which is saying that we're on, uh, they've got processors stopped on this line. This is line 90, just after the MPI in it. So you can see your source code. You can leap around your functions and so forth. Uh, you can see, uh, can move them around a bit. Um, but over here on the right, you can see your variables. So my rank at this point in time is 32767. And it's the same value on every process. That seems a bit strange. OK, but if we, that's because we haven't executed this line yet. So with a debugger, you can actually step through your application and watch as it changes. So I can also see the local variables, all the variables of my function. So see my rank here. And now as I'm going to make everyone step a single line by doing the step over. And there you see now my rank has changed. That's why it's changed to blue. And it's now a diagonal line from naught up to the number of procs. So it's done that correctly. OK? That's what we expected. Number of procs says 100. But as I move the next line, you'll see it change again. P is now 16. So we're stepping through the code as quickly as we like. We can also say, oh, I want to run to line 113. So I could either right click and say, run to here. Next. Or I could set a breakpoint by clicking in the, in the left-hand side here, then press play. Oh, it's some of them have hit the breakpoint. OK, that's all right. Uh, yep, pause. But the others have crashed. So this is exactly what a debugger would show you when things have crashed. OK? Um, processors 4, 7, 10, 12, 15 have crashed. And I've got another one, process 6, that's also had a memory error. So this is really one terrible piece of code. And we've got three different things happening here. There's those that have stopped where I expected them to stop. There's some that have crashed here. And if I look at the parallel stacks view, I can see what I've got. I've got um, 16 in total, under 113, 108. And they've all crashed. We've got the, you know, so 10 crashed here and 6 crashed here. And let's now try and figure out why they've crashed. We look over at the variables on the right hand side. And you see a loop, 4x equals 0 to 12, pretty much. And y, y, while y does not equal 12, y is incremented, as you see here. And so we've crashed on this line, updating tables x, y. So let's see what y is. y is 1470. You, you probably can't see that from the, from the back. But we're able to see the value of y across all processes. It's quite large. Um, you can also, by clicking on tables, see it's a 12 by 12 array. Actually, view it as well. We've got a nice way of viewing arrays. Let's see. As such. OK. Um, but fundamentally, knowing that y has gone completely crazy here is, is the solution here. And what you, can, what you would observe is that uh, the incrementer is going around adding my rank plus 1. And only if my rank plus 1 was a, a factor of 12 would it actually pass this line and end up here, which is why we've got some processes got there and others have not. So that's what you'd see inside a debugger. There's so much that you can do with, these, with debuggers that is so much more powerful than just adding a print statement to things. One thing I, I try to do with another debugger that I can do with print statements is look at an array or a matrix with two processors, not just look at it, but like do a diff. So I want the debugger to tell me if they are exactly the same or not. OK. Um, we don't do that. But what we can do is do them side by side. So but then if they're so huge, you, yeah. I need a print statement for that, right? Yeah. OK. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, there'll be other ways of, yeah, but fundamentally, yeah, you can plot them together. And then we can visualize them side by side. So that's actually done it on all 16 procs. Oh, so I know what And you see we've got some crazy values in there. As you can see, the benefit of the, uh, the native GUI here, this is using the um, OpenGL uh, graphics of the laptop rather than the remote VNC or SSH tunneling, et cetera. What is that? Is that visualizing just on one process? This is visualizing all of the processes. So I've got 16 of them being shown here. And it's stitching them together um, horizontally in this case. You can actually do, if you had an XY grid of processes, you could, you know, if your d domain was a sort of XY, you were, how you divided up your processes, you could do that as well. Do, uh, okay. 
But you can look for things. If you wanted to look, at, look for a NAN across every process, you could just add a filter here and say only show if dollars value equals is NAN or something like that. OK. OK, uh, you can also edit inside DDT. So having seen this is the bug, then I would very quickly then say, uh, actually, Y should be incremented. And then I would save it. And then I would be able to build it. Uh, just configure, it should say make, and it should be, uh, I think it's in this directory. Um, so let me build it. If I go for the build, uh, OK, I've got a terrible make file here. Uh, but I think it's, think it's run through and made it. And then I can restart within the same queue session and test my fix. OK. Maybe I could have one minute to show a profiler while we're here, if that's uh, not too much of an imposition. I know we've seen a lot of profilers today, but uh, just uh, I'll end this one with one last uh, demo of how that works so that you can apply this when you get onto Cooley. So we've just done debugging of one problem. Let's press the button to go into map. This is a code that just built, was built with regular make. It did have the, the minus G flag as if I was debugging it. I was going to profile. I'm not going to profile that simple code that didn't do anything because that would be a waste of time. But uh, I will try and profile this example. And I think it's, I'll do it small, minus h, 100, minus 100, and submit. And again, we'll wait till that loads up. Yeah, OK, we've got a session. It'll take about. Yeah, well, it's just waiting. We can take set questions for sure. Just a quick question. What are the licensing, licensing um, kind of issues for um, DDT? Can, how many cores can I run, um, and what are the costs? It depends on the size of the, of the license, basically. Um, so the, the, uh, the work, there are workstation licenses that are priced to be very affordable, and you know, you know, individual people can get them. And then there's like larger. Ask how many cores we pretty much, yeah, we yeah. Have without yeah. institution. Okay. Exactly. You pro if you've got it, then you'll have a limit on the number of concurrent tokens that can be used, basically. Okay. Yep. And if if there's in the Argon systems, we have a, a full system license currently. Mm -hmm. So during during the class here, you can run any size. Is this better than Total View? I wouldn't. I would <laughs> never say anything like that. Um, those guys make a great product as well, and uh, they'll be up in a moment to do a demo. OK, so this is map going off in the background. It's running for a few seconds, but I can just stop it after a certain period of time. And now I'm just going to, you'd see normally see the output from your code here. Um, in this case, uh, there wasn't any, so that's not very interesting. Then it merges the data at the end, and then you should be able to then see through uh, exactly what's gone on your code. Any other questions whilst I'm up? No? Um. When you run a very, you know, very in a very high mode, like power of 20,000 cores, is um, you know typically there is a lot of writes. How, do you have a suggestion for for you know, picking point? There are a few writes that fail. Yeah, when um, so when you're working at that scale, I would still debug all of them because you can. It's still fast. And then you're able to highlight what's different. That's what your know, DDT is good at. It's highlighting the differences. So you can see which processes to, to focus on. You can even create a group based on the ones that are broken, if you like, and analyze and only step and play with those. Okay. So this is the kind of view you would see with Map as soon as it's finished. Um, what you can see through this code is a gradual increase in the use of memory over time. You can see the CPU floating points. It's like 1.5% of time. Um, we also integrate with your version control. So if Bob broke the code again last week and put a, a problem in there, you would also be seeing it alongside. OK. Uh, but you can choose to see things like the actual kinds of CPU instruction you're seeing, uh, whether you're getting that's memory accesses in this case. So this code really does do quite a lot of that, 60-something percent, not much floating point, a lot of branches, and that kind of thing. So there's lots of things you can see in there, and we'll all play, hopefully play with that later. It's there and ready on Cooley to just, just run. OK? And we can see down here stack trace the stacks and functions that are used in the most time. So I will not take up any more time. So thank you. <laughs>